I generally put my I generally put my story in kind of in the middle of my sermon. But you're gonna get the story first. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Louise, can you and Pastor Hal come to Thanksgiving dinner at our house this Friday? I have this really, really big turkey and I don't want a ton of leftovers. Tracy implored her friend. Well, I'd love to, but we always invite a widower, Andy Vespa, each Thanksgiving. I don't want him to be by himself with his pork and beans. <clears throat> of course, Steve and Vicki will be here too, Louise replied. Andy's always been a part of this family gathering. I know Andrew. I visited his wife, Della, at the VA hospital when she was dying. Bring him along, Tracy exclaimed. Tell Steve and Vicki I expect them too. Tracy took a finger count of her guests. There's our family, Jimmy, me, Adam, Aaron, Jacob, that's five. Then Hal, Louise, Steve, Vicki, and Andrew, that makes 10. Two more would be not make it nice since I have 12 place settings. Isn't that how a woman would think? Yeah. And more than enough food, she thought. She put in another call. Cindy, I have a problem that involves a big turkey. If you don't have any Thanksgiving dinner plans, would you like to come here? That'd be great. I wasn't going to fix a turkey dinner for just Steve and me. Who all will be there, she asked. You two, the five of us, the four Faust, and Andrew Vespa. See you at six o'clock, and don't bring anything except your appetite. <laughs> Little did Tracy know that God was the maitre d' in charge of this dinner party, and he had used, and he had used of all things, a turkey and a snowstorm to make the arrangements. After everyone arrived and introductions were made, they sat down for their bountiful Thanksgiving feast. Bowing their heads for grace, Tracy, <coughs> Tracy peeked up at Andy. His big, gnarled hands were folded like a child's. What a gentle man, she thought, but he looks so sad. When they had finished two pumpkin pies, Tracy said, this was such a nice time. We were supposed to be with our families in Minneapolis, but the weather storm warnings changed that. Looking at her guests, she, she smiled, her Tracy smiled. Thank you for being part of our family on this special day. Then came the question that would change lives. Mr. Vespa, do you have any family? Andy's eyes teared. No. I'm alone. My wife Della and I had no children. She died a few years ago. I miss her every day. Well, Andrew, we'll just take care of that. Since you do, we don't have family around here and you're alone, how about being my children's grandpa? <laughs> this question took everyone off guard. What would he say? And finally, Andy broke the silence. I think I could do that. Great, but there are conditions. <laughs> That's all I can mother. Mm -hmm. You have to come to all their activities with me, band and chorus concerts, basketball, football, baseball games and plays. You know, all that stuff. Will you do that? I suppose I can, he replied as he considered his responsibilities of being a grandpa. And of course you will go to church with us. That's a given. The fourth pew up front is our spot each week. <laughs> and there's room for one more. We'll pick you up around 10 o'clock. Got it? Okay, anyone for a game of risk? <laughs> Bossy, isn't she? Andy smiled with a twinkle in his eye. Tracy took a risk by giving Andy a challenge. Andy took a risk in accepting the challenge. Over the next six years, the two built a special relationship. Tracy was always called him Andrew as a sign of respect. And yes, she did boss him some, boss him some, like the time she laid down the law about housekeeping. Andrew, you will clean your house. To which he replied, I like it as it is. In that case, 
My sons can never come to a sleepover. And remember, they're your grandsons, right? <laughs> he agreed. And Tracy and he tackled the job. When Andy's garage caught fire, Tracy decided it was time to move him to assisted living, where he would get good meals and care. There his, there his bulletin board was covered with posted notes. Doctor's appointment Tuesday. I'll pick you up. Be ready. After lunch. Tracy. Visitors. No sweets for Andrew. He's diabetic. Aids. Make sure Andrew practices giving himself his insulin shot. Oranges in the refrigerator. Needles in the cupboard. And always a reminder, Andrew, I love you. Tracy. Tracy visited or called him every day. Once a month, he attended Lydia Circle's Bible study. He enjoyed telling stories about God taking care of him all his life. When it was time for dessert, Andy said the grace. Then he would add, now don't tell Tracy that I ate this piece of apple cobbler. She won't like it. Everyone knew that Andy and Tracy's relationship was more like a father-daughter one. Both had been blessed by God. On his 95th birthday, they celebrated at Tracy's. <coughs> I'm sorry, my allergies are you know, acting up. Celebrated at Tracy's with cake and ice cream. When Andy got home, he felt so blessed. Crawling into bed that night, <coughs> his final blessing came as he slept, the blessing of eternal life. In our gospel reading today, we hear what is called the Sermon on the Mount, as recorded by Luke. It is also recorded in a similar form by Matthew. Some think that it is one long sermon. The majority, however, understand it to be a compilation of many teachings of Jesus. Even though there are differences between the two gospel recordings, one thing is sure, Jesus' words were revolutionary. They exploded like bombshells in an already charged atmosphere, upsetting the accepted standards taught by the religious leaders of that time, exposing fake piety by focusing on true humility. Jesus' popularity was rising. His teachings had been confirmed with miracles such as healings and deliverance from demons. When people heard Jesus was in the area, they flocked to see him. So it was in our gospel story that an enormous crowd turned out to hear him. What Jesus laid out for them that day were the traits he looked for in his followers. The Beatitudes, as they are called, explain how to be blessed. They may sound like contradictions. But God's way of life contradicts the world. Indeed, we will not be blessed by following the world's standards, but by living according to kingdom standards. This is what Tracy did for Andrew. She lived by following God's way, and Andrew was blessed. I am so blessed to have a comfortable house, food on the table, family, and friends. They bring me great happiness. We hear that often. Yes, it's nice to have all these things, but blessed means more than happiness. What about those who don't have them? Are they being punished? In the Beatitudes, those Jesus calls blessed don't seem to be. The Beatitudes don't promise us laughter and pleasure or prosperity. When Jesus uses the word blessed, he meant experiencing hope and joy outside of our circumstances. We find hope and joy, the deepest form of happiness, by following Jesus no matter what the cost. The Beatitudes should be looked at as a whole because they challenge the way we live out our faith on a daily basis. They contrast kingdom values with worldly values. For instance, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, clashes 
with a worldly view of pride and personal independence. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled, clashes with pursuing personal needs. These two Beatitudes can stand alone, but they are also connected to one another. Those who only look to their own needs overlook those who have needs. Their material possessions and financial security cause them to think they have no need. They lack nothing, and so they have no need for God. They seem to be rich in the sight of the world, but in reality, they are extremely poor and do not even recognize it. Jesus did not exalt poverty, but he made it clear that those who are poor would ultimately be blessed because they could count on Jesus. They know that their hope and trust can't come from the world, so they look to God for help. The picture of the kingdom of God that Luke paints is this passage and the picture that Jeremiah paints are rooted in a living relationship with our Savior. It is nourished by his word and sacrament. It is proclaimed in worship and praise. Jesus challenges us with a vision of God's kingdom. That kingdom may not be what we expected, that vision may not be what we wanted to see. Yet Jesus keeps expecting us to turn toward that kingdom he is offering us as an individual and as a community of faith, a gracious invitation. When we look to God for help, we will be blessed. Whether rich or poor, we are to rely only on God. When wealth, power, prestige, and position reflect our own self-importance, we are lost. When we take what we have and use it for others, like Tracy in our story did, we find true blessing. Using our possessions as agents of God's grace, we are set free to help others experience Christ's love, that is kingdom living. Blessed are you who are poor, might be reworded re as blessed are those who realize that they can't depend on the things of this world for happiness and put their trust in God. When we see our own poverty, we begin to glimpse what it means to be happy, to be truly blessed. Finally, we have placed our trust in the only place that we are sure of, Jesus Christ. Amen.